Hi, everybody. We're here to talk about developing an illustration. That's right. My name is Stan Prokopenko. My name is Marshall Vandruff. And we are the Draftsman, the Draftsman Podcast. Podcast. Hosts. Hosts. Could have been better, but I think we should just move right on. Isn't that a principle? You stumble, just keep going. Don't go back and re-stumble. Yeah. We should talk about it at least three more times. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's just jump right in. So. What do we mean, first of all, by developing? And then what do we mean by illustration? <laughs> developing an illustration. Okay, you want me to answer? First of all, I'll, I'll define illustration. Okay. And this episode is not really about illustration, specifically what that word really means. It's actually yeah. what I mean by it is really just like developing a complex picture. <laughs> okay. Right? All of my preparation to define what an illustration was is just for naught? Pretty much. Complete waste of time, Marshall. So, <laughs> we, I think you can still go over what an illustration is, but really, I think this, the concepts we're going to talk about, the developing part of this, mm -hmm. they apply beyond illustration. They apply to fine art. They apply to anything that needs to be developed um, yeah. because I use this process for my paintings and I'm not an illustrator. Yeah. <laughs> so, I just wanted to clear that up that yes, we are using the word illustration but it can apply to fine art paintings, it can apply to any kind of narrative, um, anything that needs to be worked out. Yeah. Um, now, now, tell us, what does it mean to develop? It's what you just said. It's not a picture that happens in a spontaneous flow from beginning to end. An illustration or an assembled picture, why don't we call that an assembled picture, usually has stages in it and that's why we use the term developing. It has a part in the process where there's no picture, where there's ideas for a picture, where the ideas could be several but then they can change a lot from there to the finish. So, the idea is that this is something that grows and changes from beginning to end. How's that for a working definition? I like that. I like that. And the reason that I wanted to talk about this topic is because there's a lot of artists around right now who do the opposite of this and it really works for them. Like who? Kim Jong-gi, Karl Kapinski, and by the way, they also develop illustrations. Like, let's be honest here, they, they, they do have a process where they don't just stop with their sketches. Sometimes they have a client where they, they, they do several sketches and then they develop it into something bigger. I mean, especially Karl Kapinski, he does magic cards or did, I guess, maybe he still does, I don't know. But he, I mean, he's an illustrator, he doesn't just do the sketches that you see on his Instagram. In fact, yeah. he was, at, at first he was actually afraid of putting those sketches up on his Instagram because he thought nobody would care about them. Hmm. But it happens to be that people actually care more about his sketches than they do about his final product, huh. which is kind of why we need to have this, uh, this conversation right now is because that the sketch part of it is so sexy, right? Hmm. <laughs> Sorry to use that, but it's like, it's people look at him doing this and it seems so effortless mm -hmm. and it feels like his sketch is a complete product. It mm -hmm. feels like it's done. It's like, what are you going to do with it? This sketch is better than the final. Yeah. A lot of artists really do prefer the sketches over final, more cleaned up pieces. Yeah. And some artists are just really good at it. Like Karl yeah. Kapinski, Kim Jong-gi is like the most famous, I think, example yeah. of someone whose sketches just like effortlessly flow, flow out of his pen and it looks like there's no planning. Um, there is planning but it's like in real time. Yeah. And it's just like the, the, end, the product right there, his sketch is like so good. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really dangerous for, I don't know, maybe dangerous is the wrong word. It can be bad yeah. <laughs> for young and beginner artists to th think that that's how it's done. Yes. When in reality, it is usually not done like this. Yeah. It is very rare for people to be able to have such an amazing complete picture out of the gate in the first try. Yes. Um, 
I so agree. That's why we need to talk about this. There is a good thing about watching someone on the level of Kim Jong Gi, is that it lets you know that that can be done. Mm -hmm. It seems like evolution tends to happen in these. Once it happens, it starts to happen all over, and it seems to me that because people are doing these, uh, they're watching him. There's like watch clubs of people that are going to watch him draw, and other people who have come to this level of high spontaneous improvisation where you just pour it out and find it as you go. What a wonderful new standard. But it can also be a sense like when you're watching an Olympic athlete to try it on your own and say, I'll never get there. So, it can be discouraging. Yeah. Well, how does someone learn to play a good game? You know, here's it's actually, let's switch metaphors. Uh, we've mentioned this before. It's the difference between improvisation and music where you do not know what you're going to play until you hit some notes and then you start to riff on that and respond to it versus composing something that other musicians must play and charting it out and all of the work that goes into that. They have a lot of things in common, but they are certainly two different processes. So, that's why I do think it's worth saying, let's be realistic. If you're going to do your best work, especially as you're getting your your first experiences developing finished pictures, then put an emphasis on the word developing because it happens in stages. I'd like to talk about uh, some examples maybe <laughs> of like, okay. first of all, I'm going to guess how I do it, how I go in stages and then maybe some other artists. Okay. Well, you've mentioned that you're not an illustrator, but that you work mm -hmm. in stages and you do something very similar to the way a professional illustrator works. Tell me about that. Well, I think so. I don't, I mean, I've never been a professional illustrator, so I guess I don't know. I'm sure every illustrator has their own methods as well. So, it's not like there's a standard that every illustrator goes through. Um, but I personally, I need those stages in order to develop my picture. First of all, brainstorming. Just like throwing stuff on paper, seeing what sticks, what's good. Most of the time, it's it, it really feels awesome in my head and then I start maybe sometimes I'll write it down and immediately the idea sucks just mm -hmm. by writing it down. I'm like, oh, wait, is that good? But sometimes, you know, write it down and it's like, okay, this, this is workable. Let's see, let's see how we could improve on this and maybe then you start doing thumbnail drawings, just little compositions and, and maybe at that stage I realize how much it sucks, <laughs> how boring <laughs> my vision actually is yeah. and how I need to really start improving it like, okay, do I need to figure out maybe a different angle on this? Do I need to figure out um, different poses for the characters or do I just kill this idea because it's just lame? Um, what Anything goes at this point, you just start trying things out. Once I feel like I have an idea that looks good on paper, both in words and as a little thumbnail. And I've tried out several variations of that thumbnail, different angles, different values. The value composition has to tell the story. What if I make the background dark? What if it's light? How does that visually play with the, the mood of my idea? And so, I'll go through, I'll do that, then I start developing everything within that thumbnail a little bit more. Uh, and really, it depends on what what is in it. But let's just go with my the example of the the very first large painting I did, which okay. was this the wood wood chopping thing, where it was like a little boy and his father, grandfather, uncle, whatever, teaching this boy how to chop wood. Basically, at that point, what I did is like, okay, I know that they just they're standing there around this this piece of wood, and I want this to feel like it's a farm. Now let's develop each piece of it. What pose is the the father in? What pose is the son in? What is in the background? Oh, there's a pile of wood. Okay, the, what kind of cabin do we need? Where are they located? I, I start making all these little decisions. Sometimes those decisions make me shift the things that I did primarily in the thumbnail, right? Like yes. you start working out the details and you realize some of the things in the previous stage don't work. You need to make changes. Sometimes not. So. Then I, I, would, I went and I started having photo shoots. So, I hired a, 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 you know, a boy which was a, the a son of one of my students and I did a photo shoot having him in a variety of poses 
and then I hired the father, another model, and I took pictures of that. Then I found a wood, uh, what is it called? A place that just sells a bunch of wood. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. A wood yard. A wood yard. Yeah. I actually, it was just so weird how I was driving. I was like, there's a bunch of wood right there. Oh, yeah. And, and it's like a pile of wood. So, I just like drove up and I like took a picture of it. Yeah. And then I, I, I think I drove up to Julian or something and I took a picture of a barn. Um, or I might have done some research online and found um, pictures of barns in Ukraine. I don't remember actually what I did for the barn, but whatever. And then I, I got a bike because I realized, okay, I, got, I need something in this corner. And I got my grandpa's old bike and I put it and I had a little photo shoot with the bike. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I had to make sure that the sun was coming from the same angle as all the other things in the composition. And then I pieced them all together in Photoshop. I was like, okay, this looks kind of cool. You start squinting at it. You, you bring it back to black and white. Then I did a small drawing of it. So, it was probably like an 8 by 10 inch drawing. You know, it's not a thumbnail but it's not like a giant thing anymore. Like now I'm working with photos and I'm combining all the details from the photos with the thumbnail sketch and trying to do something in like an hour or two and see if it still makes sense, if it still works on that level with all this new detail. It's well, I have a question. A little... I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, but I have ahead. a question. When you say you're trying to see if it still makes sense and if it still works, do you find that as you develop it, it sometimes gets worse than the original I the original idea suggested it would be? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> almost almost every time. Yes. That's that's the point of this yeah. is that as you add details, they start getting in the way of each other. Yes. You need and, and you need to make adjustments. That's the whole point of this process is so that you don't go from thumbnail to now your giant piece and you dis you're discovering all this these problems on your main painting. Yeah. Because it's so much harder to fix them in your big painting than on this 8x10 graphite drawing. Yeah. I could do three of those in a few hours. And work out all the kinks. Or not all and the then, kinks. Not all the kinks. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Because then once you scale up, right. now there's new problems. But at least now you're just dealing with those problems. Right. Right? You're, you're, not, just deal you're not dealing with like main composition problems <laughs> that could have been worked out on an 8 by 10 sketch. Yes. Um, uh, quite often I will also do a color comp, a color study. Because so far, all of the stuff has been just kind of like big shapes, poses, uh, you know, alignments of shapes and, and value and all that stuff. Um, and But the colors need to work too. Mm -hmm. And so, I will do another kind of small, probably a little bit bigger than, than the 8x10. Sometimes it's an 8x10. It really just depends <laughs> my mood. Uh, but a color composition where I'm not focused on the proportions or the drawing. I'm really just focused on the the way the colors are interacting, mm -hmm. right? Color harmonies. Yeah. Sometimes I will end up doing a bunch of small thumbnails again where instead of value, I'm now I'm just playing with color and trying out different variations of color. If there's bo like human bodies in there in my somewhere in my composition, I will do anatomy studies. Where I'll just like isolate this one figure and I'll start drawing everything about the anatomy of that person, making sure I understand everything going on in the anatomy of that pose. Um, yeah. It's kind of extreme. It, 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 it may be a little too extreme for some people, but this is how I like to work. I like to work out all this stuff in advance and make sure I'm really understanding it before I go to the final. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. Okay. I mean, sometimes there might be other things I really want to make sure I work out before. Like maybe there, like perspective is a really big deal in this and I want to plot out the perspective. Like there's just so many elements into it. Like there's maybe a wagon and a house and a tractor and a, a railroad track and whatever it is, you know. And if all these elements need to make, need to work in perspective, I'll probably plot out the perspective and make sure it's all working as well. Um, but usually my, my paintings will have more organic things in them than, than like mechanical and so that, that's much more rare for me than doing anatomical studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, 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 my mouth is getting dry because I'm talking too much. What? Okay, well, what you <laughs> just described was in some ways a million miles away from the spontaneous <laughs> okay. 
pour yeah. it all out on one piece of paper approach that's so sexy and impressive that is is worth paying attention to, but this is a whole different process. And I do have a question for you because as you yeah. described it, I felt like you were summing up uh, what you get out of that wonderful book that everyone concerned with developing an illustration should know about. It's, it's Norman Rockwell's How I Make a Picture, Rockwell on Rockwell. Mm. And other, some other good books too, of course, uh, Andrew Loomis's Creative Illustration. But Stan, here's the question. Had you read those books when you learned <laughs> no. this process? So, no. how did you learn how no. to go about it this way so that you didn't get caught up in the, I must sit down and pour it out loud on this paper in one sweep and it must look good mentality? Who taught you this? Mm. Did you learn it in school? I think so. I think I did learn it in school. I, now, it wasn't taught like step by step, like here, you guys have to do this, 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 and this. I mean, certainly thumbnails, the concept of thumbnailing before you go big was introduced at school. Like mm -hmm. that, I mean, I think everybody kind of understands that at, at some point. But going beyond just thumbnail to big sketch, now you, you, you do individual studies. I, there was a, a, definitely some of that in school where we would do color studies before mm -hmm. the final. Sometimes we would do tracings of a photograph and make sure we understand the anatomy. Not mm -hmm. necessarily to go to, uh, to bring it to now a, a bigger painting, but just to understand. Yeah. Just as like an exercise to learn, we would do all these different exercises. And I kind of, I guess I just carry that over to the process of creating a picture yeah, as well. That makes sense. It just makes sense because it, it, I mean, I realized how important that was to really just understand what I'm looking at Yeah. yeah. if I'm working from photo reference. You are now already experienced in the fact that there's a time for this and a time for that and a time for the other thing. And so, it makes sense yeah. that those things are kind of going to come into the process. I remember the first time it made a big impression on me before I knew anything about this. I was a first or first and a half year student at the junior college and there was a guy who was doing a professional job even though he was in the class, he was a year or two ahead of me and he was showing it to our teacher who was explaining that if he was going to airbrush this or do it with watercolor, it was some process that was going to be risky because you put time into it. And he said, uh, I would work that out before you do anything on the finished illustration board because to go to the finished illustration board before working, art, uh, working it out would be very unsmart. And the intensity that came out of his face made me think, I don't want to be unsmart and yet <laughs> my inclination is That's I want to go right to the finished board. So, it took me about a year to implement that, integrate it into my process to work in stages. You know Nikolai Feshin, right? Yes. Oh, yes. I know Nikolai Feshin's yeah. work. Yeah. It Almost seems like when you look at his stuff, it feels so spontaneous. Uh, spontaneous. It thank does. You. It, it like, feels like it grew it on the paper. That it, it there was no artist doing it. It just all had its own life that found itself <laughs> yeah. in there with all its strangest. Yes, I love that quality yeah. about his early work. I was talking to Morgan Weisling the other day, and and we both just like realized that we're like obs both obsessed with Nikolai Feshin. I can and see why. He was telling me how if you make his paintings black and white. They look just like his drawings. The way he drew was really was just preparation for his paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you just look at his drawings, they're basically a map. He would create a map for himself mm. for the paintings. And he says that it's actually pretty rare to find artists that where everything is just like so perfectly planned out. Um, he said Zorn also had etchings where like it almost seems like every brushstroke was planned out. Yeah. But like you look at people like Sargent and the sketch that they left was like kind of, it was like, okay, yeah, you kind of planned it out, but it was not even close to what the final product looked like. Yeah. Right. It was much more rough, kind of the general idea of what's happening. Yeah. Um, I do see but that. Yeah. Like Zorn and Feshin specifically, he was saying like, these are great people to look at, to really compare, like look at the drawing, look at the painting. Mm -hmm. It's like. He really did plan this stuff out. Um, it's like he has a map in his head before he goes into the painting. He doesn't just like throw stuff and see what happens. It's like everything is deliberate. It's not spontaneous. Yeah, different personalities have different control needs, I think. 
And a person who says, I want everything solved before I go to that finished piece, uh, that's, that's high control needs, but in a way, it frees them up to where yeah. I have made my decisions and if I want to improvise on those last stages, I've got that option. Whereas a person who does not want to solve everything before they go to the finished piece has less high control needs. They like the thrill of going into it a little unprepared. And uh, we have we have mentioned this before. Ralph Steadman likes to not know where it's going so that there's the thrill. Uh, yeah. On the Dean Martin show, they used to like to be a little under-rehearsed, under-rehearsed to go on primetime television. How risky that is, but it also gave them a jolt of energy that they felt made uh, made the performance better. Whereas with, with other things, you just don't do that. You've got to have everything rehearsed. So, it's going to be different per job and it depends on a number of factors. What do we talk about next? Should we talk about what those factors are? Well, first of all, I, I want to say like for me, having the difficult things planned out mm -hmm. gives me some confidence now yeah. to be a little bit more loose and spontaneous with some things like brush strokes. I've made these decisions. I can see it's going to work. Yeah. I'm not going to have to make these huge revisions anymore. And so now I just, I feel like it's going to be easy from here. I could play. I could mess around with some of these other things and it's still going to work because I've really solved the hard stuff already. And by that freedom and that confidence that it's going to work allows the spontaneity to be better now because I'm, I'm, not scared. Examples are starting to flood into my mind, but one that is in an analogous art form in filmmaking, Sidney Lumet talked about on the commentary of the verdict about how having every word written and having everything planned out did the opposite of making it feel stilted. It made them, it made the actors able to forget about what was written they can follow along with what was written but they've got they've got a confident foundation that this will work and they can leap off into something else now that does apply to yeah. to illustration oh of course hey stan there's something that we haven't taken up yeah that is important to this the way illustrations have been developed for centuries has been a certain way because they are done with traditional media and now that we've got digital tools where things can be completely changed at the end, it has changed the process. Let, let me take a minute to explain that. Yeah. It used to be that if you put 40 hours into an illustration and somebody wanted to move something into another part of the picture plane, that was a major surgery to do that. In some cases, you just have to do the painting over again. And to change the color scheme, to say to make to make the colors different, it was just impossible without painting it all over again or doing really elaborate procedures. Now, you've got options of making macro changes in a picture all the way up to the finish of the picture. So, it has changed and I haven't given a lot of thought to how that affects training. I'm giving it thought. But I do think that there are some things that never change. Keep going with your thought. W what are those things? Here is the main thing that I think of. Have you ever heard the story about uh, the jar full of rocks that if you dump them out, they're rocks of different sizes. If you dump them out and then have a person try to fill the jar full with the rocks again, they will often not be able to get them all in. And there's a secret to how to get them all in. Do you know what the secret is? I, I feel like it has something to do with like the si the sizes of the rocks because like the little ones need to go into the into the cracks between That's the right. big ones and if you right. somehow prevent, you know, if there's a bunch of empty space at the bottom because these big rocks are stacked and you can't get the little ones back in there. It is right? exactly is that. <laughs> that. It is that if you okay. put in the big rocks first, you can get them all in and if you get the small rocks in there first, then the big rocks are going to be uh, hindered. Right. And this is why 
Thumbnails come first. General ideas come first. Thumbnails are first. Smaller they are, the bigger the problems you're solving. And as you gradually work things out, you might say, yeah, but at the end of my illustration in digital, I can rearrange the entire thing. Yeah, you can. But yet at the same time, you may be putting a lot of time into a process where you're polishing and developing stuff that will be left out. So it's better mm. typically as a process, certainly, it's better to solve big problems first and gradually put the energy into the problems that you may not even have to solve if you're going to, de to delete them. Right. That's, that's the one general principle that I think has always held and continues to hold, even though there's people are going to look for exceptions to it. But uh, it's a way of training to make it so that it's, it's more efficient. And if you've had experience where you keep putting energy into it and keep trying to fix something and keep trying to fix something and frustrate yourself, and then later after you've wasted all that time trying to fix it, saying it would have been better off left out in the first place. That's why a macro to micro process helps. In, yeah. fa in fact, I am, I am tempted, even though I'm starting to get a reputation of overdoing this six colored hats approach to thinking. Uh, the six hats that Edward de Bono made popular are really useful for solving problems of what to do when and the blue hat, the white hat, uh, the red hat, the black hat, the yellow hat, the green hat, putting those in their proper place, that might be worth pursuing somewhere in here. I don't know right now though because I, wa I, wanna, I wanna do what we ought to do is put the blue hat on right now and look up over this and say in our conversation about developing an illustration, what have we covered? Uh, what do we need to continue to elaborate on and where do we need to go from here? Well, do you think it's worth talking about what the macro things are and what the micro things are? Or does it, is it really too much of like, it depends on what you're doing? Well, <laughs> let's, let's take up what the macro things are. I feel like I kind of know generally, but I might be looking at it only for what I've been doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like the idea itself is, ma is super macro. You got to develop the idea first, which yeah. is why I start with like writing it down. The little thumbnail is macro because it's the composition, the camera angles, the pose. Um, then after that, doing focusing in on the objects and starting to, you know, starting to zoom in a little bit and figuring out the, how every object in here works, mm -hmm. you know, and then leaving the, the micro stuff, which is like the brush strokes, like that stuff, that's the stuff I leave for the painting itself. I don't need to work it out. We've made the point that developing means that it, it takes time and it happens in stages and it changes. Illustration can be, we, we can lump it in there with fine art or any kind of picture making or even furniture making for that matter that takes stages and changes as it goes. But because we used the term illustration, we should probably distinguish that even that category of illustration has so many subcategories that become important. Advertising illustration which is what I did most of, is one kind and in my case, I had no say on the brainstorming process and what the idea would be. Editorial illustration, uh, an editorial illustrator may have all sorts of say in what it will be but they'll work with an editor. A children's book illustrator may be working with a writer or it all may be in their control. Cartoonist, the same way. A greeting card illustrator, it might be different. Now, let's, but just let's take advertising because with advertising, you've got consumer advertising, you've got advertising that's only within, in, uh, within an industry, you've got stuff that advertises a product, stuff that is for PSAs and advertising an idea, you've got technical illustration. There's just this whole range. Book illustration is a whole different world than advertising illustration for the kind of, of problems to solve. So, the first big blue hat concern is what is this picture for? Why am I doing it? 
Am I doing it for a client? Am I doing it for myself? Is it one of a series? In fact, the word illustration comes with the same root word as the word illuminate. It means to shine light on something other than itself, which is why a story which exists with words or in your mind could have some pictures. Let's illustrate them. Let's uh, open up some light on what these characters and what this environment might look like. Uh, so, illustration is to serve something outside of itself and that becomes crucial to what the decisions are going uh, the decisions are going to be for what it serves now i'm 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 going too long on that that's the uh, the blue no, hat no, thing no 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 that's good but the blue hat thing is why am i doing this in the first place yeah and if it's just i've got to make some money and they need a picture of this that is going to call up one kind of energy versus I want this to be something that is my best work. I want it to make people want to read the story. I want to show the thing or hint at the thing that I was always curious about within this story. That's the big first question. Why am I doing this picture in the first place? That episode we did last year on the six thinking hats. I you did it. Yeah, I did it. That's right. Uh, I was gone. I was on paternity leave. Yeah, I have found that to be really valuable in assessing projects. And when it comes to an illustration, of course, the blue hat thing would be first. Uh, the next hat that has to be gone into is the white hat, which is the technical specs. Is this a vertical thing? Is it a horizontal thing? Does there have to be a universal price code on here? Is there going to be a title over it? Those are just facts that have to be dealt with. The green hat mm -hmm. would be the thumbnailing the generating idea after idea after idea. And then before committing to any one of them, the black hat would be saying, what's the worst that can happen here? Going into the negative mode, that's the checkpoint. Are we going to go off a cliff with this or should we check mm -hmm. right now? And then once we've committed, then moving into the yellow hat, which is optimism, what could this piece be? The yellow hat is the one that thinks this could be awesome. And I want to say something about that yellow hat for illustration in particular. I'm starting to think that it's very valuable in the process. Marshall, I love the noises in the back. Keep going. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, here's why I think that the yellow hat is, is valuable in the process more than I ever realized. It's the one that's, it, that puts on deliberate optimism. And Norman Rockwell stated that every picture he did was better when he was thinking of it in his imagination than it ended up being. Now, I'm sorry for Norman Rockwell's suffering that that means that you do hundreds of illustrations and they're all a disappointment to you. But look at what he gave us. And I think that the fact that you get energized brings up conjuring energy of what this thing could be that you wouldn't have if you only were worried about how bad it could be. So, the yellow hat is to generate optimism and then the red hat, as I mentioned about composition, it's a lot about your compositional decisions are from your gut and uh, eventually you'll go back to the white hat. But I don't think there is a hat for that final stage which is to put the paint down, uh, to put the watercolor down into the absorbent paper, to put the pen lines down so that they feel mm. good. I think that final stage on an illustration project is as much as anything else sensorial. It's about texture. It's about love of the paint. It's the romance of actually having the physical contact with the work that you're doing. Uh, that, that is the final stage and it's where, as we mentioned earlier, it's where the, the least application of, of the green hat can even happen. What if you're a digital painter and there is no physical contact, there is no smell of the paint, there's no texture? There is texture. <laughs> that is that the final stage wow. is where you can texturize it or, or uh, accent noises or blur things out. Yeah, there's the... The visual texture you can create on your, you know, in, in the painting, but it's not, you don't feel the texture of the canvas is what I mean. Right. But you've still got that love of the sensorial 
wall of <laughs> you got the light bulbs coming yeah. out of the <laughs> Okay. Hey, I, I understand that in Infinite Painter, there's a Proco brush. <laughs> there is a Proco brush. Yeah. I'm very proud of that. So that is something that toward the end of the project, I assume, could you start applying Proco brush textures to a picture or I would imagine most people would use it in the beginning. The Proco okay. brush is a charcoal. It's a freaking charcoal pencil. There's not. It's nothing special. Um, the, the, what they develop, what what they did, and why they call it the Proco brush is because they watched my my videos mm -hmm. on using the charcoal pencil and like uh -huh. holding it, you know, overhand and like getting the the soft thick to thins and like ba they they basically they used my tutorials to develop that brush to mimic the Conte charcoal pencil. And so, yeah. they called it the Proco brush. Even though I didn't come up with holding a charcoal pencil that way, right. they watched my tutorials and they developed it based on that. So, they call it the Proco brush. Yeah. Well, that's great. It yeah. got, got labeled. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Happy to get credit. I'm not yet using Infinite Painter or Procreate, but I do see what people are doing and it seems like your option for tactile textures all the way through to the end is beyond anything anyone knew would ever happen. Yeah. So, yeah, if that's the love of of the the sound of the music coming out of the speakers or coming off the instrument. Even a person who does not know how to play notes on the cello and control them, if they've got a good sense of running that bow on there, makes a wonderful yeah. feeling come out of it. So, I th that's, that's to me or at least it was in my experience doing illustrations and you see it in the love of the paint that Rockwell and Leyendecker and, and others that were such great painters, Drew Struzan doing it with the Prismacolor pencils and the little bits of gesso that he'd do for the highlights and then spraying a light wash of thin down yellow ochre on the surface. These are things that are happening toward the end yeah. that I don't know there's a hat for those but they're sort of here's, – here's an analogy that you do a lot of the preliminary work and that is the meal but you get dessert at the end. The dessert is that if you love the process of finishing it, that's the dessert. Should we try to come up with the name for this hat? We can call it like the rainbow hat. Yeah. Oh, no. It's the bald head. Bald it's head. The bald... Come on, Marshall. Don't name it after yourself. This no, is not it's, cool. <laughs> it's the bald head because the bald head is immediate sensation. There's no hat between <laughs> skin and world and there's, you don't want to put a hat on it. Oh. Uh... No? Yeah. No hat needed or wanted. Okay. I was thinking happy accident, you know, happy accidents. So, you kind of go with Bob Ross, like little rainbows or something, cloud hat or maybe like a whipped cream hat. Well, we aren't like supposed to we aren't supposed to grab <laughs> no. onto our ideas and hold on to them, but I'm going to hold on to that one. It's the ball. I'm head. I'm throwing out a lot of ideas, Marshall. You I'm are. putting on the what is it? The, the green uh, hat. The green hat. Yeah. <laughs> When you were listing all of those, you know, uh, ed you know, advertising, editorial, cartooning, you know, kids' books, um, I kind of, I want to know how does the process differ from all these? What are the, you know, why even consider this? Can you mm -hmm. give us some examples yes. of the stages of one versus the stages of another? The first thing that comes to mind is a penciler for comics and an inker for comics which have been separated into two different jobs. Right. And the writer is also a separate person and so you've got this pipeline where one thing has to happen before the other thing happens and then finally the letterer and the, and the right. colorist. So, there is an example where the profession itself has divided up the labor to where one person does one thing over and over. And yeah. I was just reading in an in interview, mm -hmm. Lee Lorenz interviewed George Booth who is quickly becoming one of my favorite New Yorker cartoonists. George Booth talked about early in his career, other people would write the gags and then he would illustrate them. And then he started to write and illustrate his own gags and he would do them by doodling. It's a different thing now. I'm coming up with the idea and I'm coming up with the position of the camera and all the stuff that's going to be in front of there. So, there's another difference. Uh, a difference with the with the advertising illustration is that ad agencies would hash out all the stuff that this campaign is going to be 
And then they would hire the illustrator only to solve technical and aesthetic and technique problems versus if I want to illustrate a work of classic literature that I get to read the book, make up the decisions myself, and the longer I take the time to do that and say, I've got a good idea for where the camera would be, what I want to show that the writer didn't include in the book. Howard Pyle and N.C. Wyeth, Wyeth was really big on that, that you're ideating about what scene to show apart from your skill at showing it is an mm -hmm. art form in itself. And I've started to see more and more that business of what you will even put in front of the camera is creative and important. And if you're making that decision and you make great decisions on that and your drawing skills aren't quite up to the level of another person who has tremendous drawing skills but they don't have that good of ideas what to show. This is just my attempt at getting our head around different illustration jobs, different picture making jobs have different responsibilities and different emphases. Yeah. No, that makes sense. There's another way to approach this. Okay. It is historically. Some of the greatest artists of history, Michelangelo and Rembrandt and Durer, have been illustrators. And we don't know a lot about their process compared to people who in the 20th century, we know a lot about their process because they might have even written books about it like Norman Rockwell did. And yeah. oh, we know a lot about the process of Leyendecker and we know a lot about the process of Drew Struzan because he was the great movie poster illustrator of the 1980s and before and after and he has a video of how he worked. I got to watch him work. I got to spend a week at a workshop, uh, a workshop with him where he talked about his process. So, we know a lot about how the last hundred years illustrators have worked and we can see what they have in common and what's different. I've spent the last 40 years plus looking at these illustrators' works, listening to everything they have to say, trying to turn it into things that will make the struggle for a student easier to get to their mm -hmm. best level. Drew Struzan showed how he did the Hellboy poster and he showed it from beginning and concepting and making pitches and approvals and non-approvals all the way through to the board and the preparation with the gesso and the airbrushing and his thought process through it. It's a very useful uh, insight into how he spends his time in his studio and that he did. Where does he show that? Uh, I'm not sure how you get hold of it, but I know it's okay. available. It's a DVD. It was a DVD, so now it should be a oh, okay. digital download. Mm, should be. Uh, Lion Decker's process. Yeah, there was a step by step magazine article on it years ago, and uh, Norman mm. Rockwell talks okay. about it in his book, My Adventures as an Illustrator, where he elaborates on the the way uh, Lion Decker would do elaborate studies and solve every problem before he would go to the finish. It just seemed like such overkill. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at Leyendecker's work, it's pretty obvious. He yeah. planned out the brush strokes, he right? To the, out to the, the angle strokes. of the strokes yeah. and how they relate to it. They're, they're a bunch of little tiles, right? Like, yeah. To me, that is a pitch to students who want to do their best work that in your training, you should do at least three pieces where you plan everything out. And if you hate it, then you can say, I'm going to find another way of working. But if you say, yeah. I do better work this way and I want my work to be better and therefore I will learn to enjoy these preliminary stages. I, I, I love the preliminary stages of, of some of the work I do. I love it more than even the finished piece. But I think yeah. with a, a lot of picture makers, however, that they love the finished piece. They love the hmm. texture of the board, the canvas, the smell of the oil paint. They want to get right to that early on. So, as a discipline, it might be good to put that off. You could get that element of it with a study though. You could do a smaller version of a painting. and. 
Yeah. Uh, like I see, like for example, my my instructor Jeff Watts, he did a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. Like his final painting would be very large, mm -hmm. very very large. Um, but then he would usually do another painting, like a you know maybe a sixteen by twenty size, where he's basically just trying to get a really good painting done, but a smaller version of it. Yeah. And that smaller painting, it's like you kind of have the freedom to mess up. Yeah. Right. It's you are. There's a. It's more fun because you know it's not the final yeah. <laughs> and so you're just like let's just see what happens and that is that to me that makes it more fun because when i start that final one it's like well this better work <laughs> yeah the least creative part is typically the finishing yeah if it's all about technique and just carrying it through but even when that comes out of my mouth, Stan, I recognize there are there are exceptions to that yeah well because it's there's a, the rehearsal all the studies, those are the rehearsals and then now this, there's this final performance which still requires creativity, it requires a lot of creativity. When you do small paintings as rehearsals, yeah, the, the smaller the painting, the bigger the problems you're solving and if when you make it bigger, it starts to not work. There was a writer say, uh, that said, nothing is worth publishing unless it's of first intensity. And first intensity, I assume, means the first blushes of love of this idea, the first things that make your energy go up to want to do that. But the difficulty is carrying through that level of first intensity all the way through the process. But if you do a little study and do a number of little studies, you've always got that to go back to. Musicians who get a musical idea and put down a track because the energy has them put down that track first, then can add to the track and arrange and do all sorts of extra stuff, but they might start to micromanage, uh, put in energy that they don't need to. They can always go back yeah. to the first intensity and say, that's what I'm trying to get and have I lost it? They've got something to compare it to, if not for development, at least for emotional sincerity, emotional energy. Along those lines, I kind of want to say it's, it would be, I think, a mistake to, you know, go small and then just take out a tiny brush. <laughs> you yeah, know what I mean by that? Yeah, yeah, I do. Right? You yeah. Like, you're not just trying to make the same painting but now on a smaller scale. Yeah, you're yeah. literally just trying to solve bigger problems here. Don't take That's out right. a one hair brush and now start painting a postage stamp. That's right. Still use a normal size brush, but now you're doing a smaller painting because you're thinking of broader shapes. Now, instead of painting a face, you're just putting down the plane of the jaw. The right. forehead is one shape or maybe three with like the front plane and the two side planes, right? That's it. You're not, you're not like painting the, the, the creases on the forehead if you're doing a study. Yes. It's not about that. It's like storytellers thinking in acts and sequences instead of thinking in small portions of scenes that might not be in there. It's, it's like a, a, a musical composer thinking in the four movements of a sonata rather than thinking just the small parts. You've got to get the big things, the big bits of this composition first. Working macro to micro is part of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it may be the biggest and most important part of the process. But also, the, the, another really big part of this is the giving yourself the freedom to fail mm -hmm. and exploring many options. Okay. It's not just going through the stages doing like, all right, I'm going to do a thumbnail, <laughs> right? I did a thumbnail. Okay, cool. There's my thumbnail. Yeah. Now let's let's do a color study. Let's do a, a you know an anatomical study. Yeah. It's like no. The point of it is to do ten thumbnails. Explore your options. Fail nine times and succeed once. Mm -hmm. Then move on to another stage. Fail nine more times. Whatever it takes. Fail as many times as you need to find that one success. That's, I think, the, the actually a bigger part of this is like, yeah, big to small, but don't forget that the whole point of this is to fail early and not fail in the final thing. Yeah. The reason you're rehearsing is to get out all the failures. <laughs> right. Big to small and multiple to few. 
and eventually Man. probably won. Now, the intensity in your voice and the energy that went up as you explained that makes <laughs> makes me wonder, why is this so hard? Why is it that there's an inclination to lock onto yeah. the first one and I I know I had it terribly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it has to be overcome and some teachers are really intent on making students do 100 thumbnails this week for this idea. <laughs> that's a little much. Uh, that's, well, but okay. but uh, there was a teacher that's, that's a good exercise, who, who yeah. had students do that and then would make them throw them away. Throw them away as, a, as an act of sacrifice to show, I want you to learn <laughs> That it is process, 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 generate, generate, oh, generate. Man. Don't hold on to any one of these. Now, uh, I would, I would, I would take a picture of them before throwing them away. But that, that's right. But there it again. Gertrude Stein uh, talked about that in the process of writing, you don't want to freeze the fountain. Oh, I've got the fountain going. It's so beautiful. I'm going to freeze it so that it stays just where it is. The better thing is to get in the habit of being willing to lose a lot of that so that you've got a primed fountain that's always ready to give you more. It's uh, the goose that laid the golden eggs is, is the uh, another one that gets at that point. Yeah. That this generating freely, happily, not clinging is a part of it. Okay, so we've got Big to small. Yeah, big to small. We've got multiple to few. We've got preparing and executing because preparation stages can be big stages in big projects like film, huge stages. It can be a year or more to prepare. With an illustration, it can be, it can be days of preparation before you actually get to the illustration. Researching, uh, preparing, getting the, uh, the line drawing ready. Uh, mm -hmm. Garbage trucks showing up in a moment. Uh, we love the garbage truck. Just keep yeah. going. The problem with the garbage truck, though, is almost every time this garbage truck comes in, I feel <laughs> like I. It's when I finally, after all of this time recording the podcast for this last half hour, I finally I have something worthy to say. Yeah, well, but this is the climax. This is when we want that garbage truck background track. To create you know? tension. Like, to create tension yes. and say, Marshall, this is your last opportunity to say something valuable to these people. Let's yes. comment on it. <laughs> what was it? It was big to small, multiple to few, preparation to execution. Hey, you know, there's another thing that happens in commercial illustration that's a big deal. And it's that you've What's got that? A, a stage of negotiating and getting the job versus producing. <laughs> and people who are not okay. doing it for a living don't know that that becomes a really big dynamic. Is that when I was first trying to get people to hire me and spending months showing portfolio and making, uh, making appointments, that there were times when I was thinking, I might have a career. I think some of these people are going to hire me. And then I thought, what if they do? I'll go into my studio and <laughs> oh, I don't crap. even know if I know how to make a picture anymore because I am so in this zone of trying to get work that I've gotten out of the habit of being in the studio and getting used to the work. So there's yeah. there's there's many of these. The thing we haven't the, the the thing that I am most concerned with and haven't really addressed here is how procreate an infinite painter and the the absolute malleability of an image all the way to the last part. That is the one thing that I don't have wired with the tension of how the process is changing. I can tell you what I've seen. I've seen that a lot of dig digital artists are able to go into this really freely brainstorming, trying it one way, trying it another way, and just doing all of their manic stuff in the beginning. And they've got an advantage that musicians had in the 20th century, that I am not doing this in front of an audience where this performance will be reviewed in the newspapers and my reputation is based on it. I'm doing it in a recording studio where if we don't like it, we can do another take and another take and another take. And they've got that option. And they can even take several takes, put them together and perhaps make something very special. So, digital is, is changing 
the options, it has changed the options, changed them dramatically yeah. in the way that recording changed the options for musicians that they did not have before. Absolutely. I got to say, I used to do most of my thumbnailing on paper. Mm -hmm. I've now pretty much do all of the early stuff digitally. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so much easier to adjust things. Yeah. It's, it's a quicker process of failing many times until I get to that success. I could do it so much quicker. Um, because you got these layers, you got undo. Um, you could take a little piece from one and just move it over to another one and, and do another version of it by just like literally just hey, duplicate this one. Now let's make an adjustment. Yeah, that doesn't work. Duplicate it again. Make another little adjustment. Compare. Yeah. If you're doing it on paper, you got to redo it again. If you really just want to make a, salt, uh, a subtle adjustment to it, you got to redo that first part again. And so, yeah, digital just, it speeds things up so much. It's, yeah. it's wonderful. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I hardly shifted. know any professionals that are not doing it that way now. Jeff Watts. Je Jeff Watts is pretty big on staying traditional. He actually, to him, he has said that like, redoing it be because he has to redo it traditionally that in itself helps him figure it out yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he's redoing that thing that he thinks works he's redoing it again and he might accidentally stumble on something new in that thing he thought worked by redoing it again mm -hmm. and going through it several times actually gets him more comfortable with it i don't know i there is something to that actually but there is. I think it really just depends on the person. It's like, do you want to get through m more failures quickly, or do you, you really just you love that part of having to go through that time, putting in that that labor to to figure it out? I don't know. It, yeah. it, I think it depends on the personality. It does, but you know, I it makes me wonder, and I know that I always bring this to other artistic disciplines. It makes me wonder how these great works of literature. How Shakespeare wrote those plays with and, and, and also when people were working with typewriters later, typewriters were technology that could speed it up. How did they write such great stuff when they didn't have word processing programs? Because the yeah. process of writing now, I was such a frustrated writer for so many years and when the word processor came in, it gave me the option to write and write and write and write and not have to retype stuff but to copy and paste and move it over. And I feel like it has helped me to realize writing ambitions because the tools make it so much easier. And somebody will say, well, easy is not the thing it's supposed to be. Somehow, mm -hmm. these people who worked on uh, by writing longhand and with typewriters got into the discipline that the speed with which their hand moved across the page as they wrote was in sync. The way Nicolaides would have you put the lines down at the speed that you move your eyes on the thing that you're, uh, that you're drawing. So that there was in yeah. sync so that your mind was disciplined to think at the speed of writing out longhand and that you knew you may have to revise but you could Make a little note next to a word that my second draft, I'll do this or get away from it, come back, rewrite the whole thing and make those revisions in these clean, clear categories. As soon as the word processor came in, there are no clean, clear categories anymore. You can start with a paragraph that you like and start to spread out from there. You can start with an outline and go down. And to me, it's just marvelous and, and thrilling and uh, I've wondered whether I would be able to write and think better if I were to go through a dose of you have to work from outline to the individual paragraphs. I think that this podcast might have been better if we had done that. Probably. But you know what? We would let make less podcasts. Um, fewer. Fewer? Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. Okay. I Go don't ahead. care I'm about sorry. how good I, I, I talk. I know. <laughs> um, I think that there is definitely an advantage to doing things slower that feel like a waste of time. For example, just one thing I learned recently about just, you know, I was talking about note taking in a previous episode. Like, 
it feels to me like a waste of time to write out notes on paper when I could do it quicker on my keyboard and I can copy and paste things I've done already and, I, you know, I can make a connection. On paper, it just seems so labor intensive and a waste of my time but I, there, it's proven the studies have proven that if you actually write it with your hand that it actually sticks better in your brain yeah um and it's like that really is the point isn't it the point isn't to have it written down and stored on your computer the point is to have it in your brain <laughs> that's why we're writing it down and but it, you know what it doesn't matter even when we're presented with these studies that prove that spending more time, wasting time is more beneficial, we're still not going to do it. <laughs> no, 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 it's not true. It's not true. I want, I want to uh, jump into this. What do you mean? Uh, so, to some people. To some, some people, people, they're still they're not going to do it. Like for me, I'm still not going to write my, my notes on paper even though I know I've seen these studies and it's like, yeah, I guess, yeah, it makes sense. I'm still going to do it digitally. <laughs> there is something so enjoyable to have a gel pen a pencil, the paper itself, and to not rush it, to look at the things that are on this paper that I instinctively put wherever I put them and then say, hey, and put a circle around that and move it over to another area that it could go over there and when it becomes a mess, starting a new piece of paper. And it's not a burden. There is something about that. Yeah. That to me is not a burden. Oh, I got to slow down. It is a privilege. I get to slow down and savor this rather than just rushing toward a deadline. I agree. Definitely. I'm still going to go digital. Uh, I know. <laughs> what you, I know. Marshall, you waste so much paper. What do you hate trees or something? No, actually, we recycle <laughs> this paper. Some of it we save. <laughs> no, actually, it's not using I'm that much teasing. paper. I know you are. I'm um, just teasing. I'm hey, just teasing. Hey, there's something else I wanted to say about what you mentioned. And it was that when you were doing, when you were doing the woodcutter illustration, that you happened upon chopper. a wood yard, wood chopper illustration. <laughs> when, when you were doing yeah. the wood chopper illustration, you happened upon a wood yard. Yes. There's something about when you know what you're going to do, you've decided I'm going to go in this direction, I'm going to put a month into this picture or whatever. There's something called serendipity that yeah. things start to come your way that you wonder whether they would have even come your way if you hadn't set out to do this or whether just the fact that you're setting out to do it heightens your awareness. That's exactly it, Marshall. Th this wood yard was there for years and I've passed, I passed by it yeah. probably like a hundred times and I never noticed it until I was looking for a pile of wood. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, <laughs> there's a pile of wood right there. But like, I would never care that there's a pile of wood. It just, it would, I would not even notice it and I didn't notice it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like recently, um, you know, my son's name is Cooper and we got him a Mini Cooper, uh, a Mini Cooper S. His, his, his name is Cooper Silas, which is Cooper S, right? And the, uh -huh. the, the, the cars are Cooper S it's and we got him car. a little Mini Cooper car and he drives it. And now I see Mini Coopers everywhere. Yeah, They're literally yeah. like on every block. Yeah. I did not know there's so many Mini Coopers around. Yeah. I never noticed them before but now I do because my son has a little version of it that he drives and he notices them all. He's like, yeah. look, it's like my, my Cooper. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's another reason why it's good to, to team up is that you've got someone else who's going to see things you don't and when they start to see them regularly, you start to see them regularly. Yeah. I yeah. see them everywhere now. Yeah. I know that feeling. <laughs> I have a whole course on creative process and I can boil down the How lessons. How much does it cost? No, it's not recorded yet. <laughs> this course that I have taught many times on the creative process that I don't have available now but I'll see if I can boil it down to something free for you right now or at least a final lesson from it is that if you are inclined toward wild creativity and coming up with ideas and you don't bring them to finish because you just love generating ideas. Part of your discipline is to learn how to do that and if you say, I don't want to do that for a living, then you have a responsibility as a wild spontaneous person 
to do what Kim Jong-gi has done, which is to get your craft up to a level to where you can generate spontaneously and you don't really have to go through stages. You can hit the notes you want to hit on the first stage. Whereas if you are a person who likes method and you like stages and you like the control of not moving on until you've solved these problems, then part of your responsibility is to work into that process early in the process uh, spontaneous burstings, brainstorming, generating many options, being crazy and wild with it. And that way you're in a safe private space to do it and you can pull out of that and gradually take it to the finish safely. But you had a dangerous stage early on in there. That's the main point for the advice of student training. Always try yeah. the other way and then find how each one of those ways fits into your process. Yeah, that's a great way of closing this episode. Yeah, you, you could either be the jazz musician or who, you know, spontaneously plays brilliant stuff or you could be the composer who plans out every note for each instrument in the orchestra, right? Yeah, but all creativity is at some point improvisation and typically in the early stages when it's a when it's a stage by stage thing. Yeah, but the the question is what's your final product here, right? That's right. All right guys, thank you very much. Yeah, see you next time. <laughs>